On this episode of Exactly How, we're going to show you exactly how to invest in mobile homes, how to get started in this business, even if you don't have a lot of money, and how to find the best mobile homes to invest in any market on this episode of Exactly How. You're listening to the Exactly How podcast, where you'll hear the underground, closely guarded wealth building secrets of successful people around the globe. Discover exactly how to improve your mental, physical, and financial health. Feel better, make more money, live, give, and prosper in today's exciting, fast paced world filled with opportunity for those who know exactly how. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Connected Investors Podcast, Exactly How. During this episode, you're going to discover exactly how to invest in mobile homes. For those of you who are new, my name is Ross Hamilton, today's host and CEO of ConnectedInvestors.com, the real estate investors marketplace and community. And today we have the privilege to learn from a man who has helped many families obtain home ownership helped mobile home investors build cash flow businesses, and has purchased and started his own mobile home parks. He's really done it all. But prior to his career as a mobile home investor, he worked at McDonald's and Walmart. All of that changed when he came to the conclusion that mobile homes was an avenue for investing that so many people overlooked and he was able to master. I would describe our guest as a really good listener. And today, he is going to explain exactly how to invest in mobile homes. I am so excited for you to meet Mr. John Fedro. John, thanks for taking the time to be here. Thanks. Thank you very much. You can add in a bunch of applause, I assume, at the yeah. uh, post. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah. For anyone here who is just uh, on the podcast, make sure to check out our YouTube channel as well so you can kind of see our guests and kind of we show some visual things throughout this presentation that you just can't get on the podcast. Keep listening to our podcast, but go to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Now, for everyone here, before we dive into exactly how to invest in mobile homes, uh, John, you contribute a lot of your success to self-guilt. That is a new one. And I'm really excited to understand why you think that's played such a big role to your success. You know, the guilt, um, maybe that's not the right word, but I really feel that it is. That, um, that the, I heard a term a long time ago, you know, motivational dissatisfaction. And I, I'm happy where I am, or I'm content with where I am, appreciative of where, of where I am, um, but I'm dissatisfied as well. I know personally that I could be doing more um, and I guilt myself a lot. I don't know if it's from upbringing or from where, but um, you know, if I know I could be doing something better, I mean, I'm my wor hardest critic. Um, mm -hmm. No one is going to push me harder than anybody. No one should, yeah. no one needs to, or no one should care to um, except me. So I, I don't know if that's something that was, if you're born with that or if something like your nature versus nurture, but the guilt, I feel it's strong and I'm, I kick my own butt every day and I guilt myself that I should be doing more. I have my big to-do list every day that I look at and keep adding things to it. So like even a dream board, you know, when, with the secret and you got to put a dream board out there, I would always look at my dream board and think like, I'm not doing enough. Like I need to be doing more and I could be doing this. What else am I not doing? So that's the kind of constant, you know, thoughts in my head day in and day out. If I'm not working, someone else is working, you know, harder than me or trying to, you know, beat me in my, in my yeah. market. So. See, you wouldn't happen to have an Italian mother, would you? <laughs> I, do. I don't have an Italian mother. No. Okay. Because, because, because I do. So when I saw the self guilt thing, I'm like, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe he's got a mom who's kicking his butt or something like that, but it's, uh, anyway, Long anyway, no, I fully, uh, you know, understand and can appreciate your ability to kind of pinpoint that as your, as your motivator. Most people don't really know what, what motivates them. And, you know, it's uh, no matter where you get, you know, you're always kind of looking for that next, for that next step. And it's about those, those constant small improvements because I did a lot of research on like happiness, right? Like what makes people actually happy as, you know, running a company here at Connect Investors, how do we keep our employees happy? How do I stay happy? And it's really about progression. People just want to know that they're moving forward. And that's really what keeps them, keeps them happy. So if you go from making $1,000 a year to a million dollars a year, and then the next year you only, you make $500,000 a year, you are not happy. If you go from a thousand a year to, you know, a hundred thousand to 500, you're happy. Like people want to see that progression and maybe that, that kind of plays a role there. So I, I very totally interesting. Agree. 
that do you, do you notice this that if you get to that next level now that's become the new the new norm now if i drop down i'm not happy it's not a gauge off of where i was it's where i am so now that i can you can almost yeah that the happiness is moving and if you don't get to you know if you don't stay at that level it's it's negative so i don't think that's healthy no. but that's the way that i'm constantly looking at things so it's like you've <laughs> got to keep getting better or, yeah well the, you know the first step in in getting better is admitting you have a problem so great. we're all <laughs> we're all learning we're, we're all learning here but um you know that's a uh, a really interesting uh you know perspective on things and you know we were uh man that was i'm just actually kind of lost uh, lost myself in the notes here but all right, now what makes the Exactly How Financial Freedom podcast very unique is every show comes with a detailed action plan. We'll go ahead and pull actionable steps out of our guest John here, and you can go right to exactlyhow.com and access this blueprint on how you too can follow these steps and keep pushing yourself and keep moving. So you can go to exactlyhow.com to get the notes, the takeaways, any resources that we mentioned on this call. And John even has a free gift he's going to give everyone on the line. So all you have to do is visit exactlyhow.com. In addition, you'll be entered into a drawing to win access to our pre-MLS software. This is where anyone can find the most motivated properties, uh, the most motivated sellers out there uh, from trailer parks, which we're going to be talking about, to apartment complexes, to your average home in a nice neighborhood. This is how you can find properties for steep discounts. If you're watching this live, visit exactlyhow.com, throw your name into the hat. We're going to go ahead and pick a winner here really soon. So, Let's go ahead and just jump right into it um, because we have a really exciting show here. A lot of people are talking about mobile home investing. I've actually seen a lot of big funds, like the big hedge funds out there moving into mobile homes as well. So this is something that, uh, that I've actually personally done myself. So I'm excited uh, to be able to, to have an expert kind of share this uh, with you because I kind of stumbled into it by accident. Um, can you just kind of define what you mean when you're talking about a mobile home, a trailer, a double wide, like a uh, you know, non-permanent foundation? I mean, wh what do you mean when we're, as we're talking through this topic? Sure. There's, the topic was so broad. When I first got into mobile homes, I certainly didn't know that um, there were mobile homes in parks. Most of us think about a mobile home, which is the, re the rectangle, uh, sitting with the wheels you know, on somebody else's land in a park with a bunch of other people that own mobile homes, paying lot rent to the landowner. And that's one way of doing business. There's also mobile homes that we can move from one location to another. There's mobile homes that are attached to their own little pieces of land that the people own as well. In fact, 75% of mobile homes in the country, around 70 to 75%, they're actually on their own little pieces of private land that the owners own as well. They're actually not inside of parks. Or you can own the entire park. Um, you know, own the, own the land, own a bunch of homes, or have people pay you rent for they, they own the home so but what I'm talking about is the main the individual rectangle that's how I got started on the piece of land that somebody else owns so you're really just buying and selling that that personal property gotcha gotcha you know and there's a there's a mobile home park not too far from from our office here and it's called wheel estates and I just love the name it's it's really called that yeah it's called real estates a pun oh that's yeah cool. okay. exactly and it's, it's it's in a great location i'm sure whoever owns all that property will uh will have a big payday yeah. um so uh what we we'll are be talking about here is actually we're we're not going to dive into the owning the actual property we're just talking about the actual uh trailer itself or is it an, or or are we going to talk about a mixture of, of both of those there's, there's so many ways to go here so many ways to go. In my opinion, if the people you know, listening are going to get started, if you only have a few grand or more than a few grand, I think there's like two thoughts. It's like either the mobile homes or the mobile home parks. So I've just got it started in the mobile home parks a couple of years ago, but I've been doing the individual mobile homes on, in, in parks that you have to move and on private land. I think in my opinion, those are all kind of one. And then you get the, the parks that are something else. But if you're going to do the one, you know, if you're going to do the, the homes on land, the homes in parks and the homes that have to be moved, those are all kind of clumped in one group. So you can do the stuff I'm going to be talking about is like that, that group. So if okay, you're going to do one, I say you do all of it. You know, perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, before the show, we talked about the, uh, the steps to actually doing this. We broke it down to first knowing what people are paying, 
then knowing who's out there, and then three, making a massive amount of offers. So I'm excited to kind of work through these. Let's jump right into step one, knowing what people are paying. What does that mean to you? Sure. Well, there's a lot of steps we're not talking about, but in step one, and I mean, I think these, these are good, like, you know, big topics to, to discuss. Um, in step one, we are finding before you make any purchase offers to any sellers, um, before you know, yeah, before you make any purchase offers to ever, any single seller, we have to understand what we're going to resell these mobile homes for. Not what we think we're going to sell them for, but what are you really going to sell them for? And if you have a lot of experience with mobile homes, then you already have the experience to know, oh, I know what they sell for. But if you're coming from single family homes, if you don't have a lot of mobile home experience, you know, that's a completely new number for you. What are people paying cash? What are people paying with payments? What are people paying down and monthly and renting? Uh, how long are these homes staying on the market if they're two bedrooms or three bedrooms, if they need work, if they don't? Some parks command an all cash price when other parks command more payments or a higher price or a lower price. So it's, so when I mean about, you know, what we can resell homes for, I want us to really understand who's out there and what are they paying? What, what have they paid? And that's going to be a combination of experience, like knowing by talking to park managers, talking to realtors and brokers, and being in the marketplace, talking to enough sellers to know who's sold what for what prices. How were they marketing the homes? How did they sell them? And what price did they sell them for? And then also you can put out, I know people have heard about test off or te test ads. That's something that you know, you're, you're putting out these fake ads of homes you don't really own to then get people to call you. I'm not a huge fan of doing that. There is some value in the beginning, but ultimately you're putting out fake ads of homes you don't own to get people to call you. And then you can ask them, well, you know, how much money do you have down? How much money do you want to pay monthly? How many bedrooms? Are you able to do repairs? And that's good. That'll get you so far, but it's a combination of, of testing, knowing what buyers are paying, talking to a lot of people. Yeah. So you'd say something along the lines of, oh, that property is no longer available. Um, we have some more coming. Uh, let me know what you're looking for and I'll, I'll hook you up. So you're you talking could, about putting out ads on like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, something like that? You could do something like that. That's pretty, that's pretty basic. And that'll, that'll, that'll get you some information. You can either talk to those people. You can message them. You can have them fill out a quick questionnaire. Um, but ultimately, some of those people can lie as well, or they can say, oh, I kept this, I have a th tens of thousands of dollars, when really they don't, or I can pay this much and they don't. So that'll only get you so far. It's also important to really talk to people already in the market. Managers know, park managers, um, realtors and brokers in the area, they have an idea, they have a good idea of what homes sell for, how long it should take, what kind of repairs are expected. So it's a combination of doing both of those. And I'm glad to say it doesn't really happen overnight. There's definitely a, like in this business of mobile homes, there's, there's a bit of a learning curve. So that does happen. Like the more you're in this business, the more you fine tune your local market. But in the beginning, it is important to know, have an idea. You don't have to know an exact idea, but know, okay, there is a lot of people that want to buy this on payments, or there's a lot of people that have cash, or there's a lot of people that have two thousand dollars but no one has twenty thousand so. dollars yeah that makes a yeah that makes a lot of sense that makes a whole lot of sense so uh just just to clarify some some questions i can see some of our viewers having um when you're selling just the mobile home are these these comps on zillow or is it an is it more like you're selling a car to where it's titled to where you can't really find that information some states it's easier than others, but in, in most states, if we're talking about just the personal property, it is difficult to find. So it would be more like a car. Okay. Gotcha. And that's, and that's why sometimes this, this, this doesn't uh, operate exactly like a traditional real estate um, business, almost more like selling cars, to be honest. Mobile homes uh, on, pro on, in parks that are personal property, you're right. Mobile homes on land then that's going to be the same public information that all the single family homes are from state to state. Some knowledge is available and some, and some isn't, but mobiles on land, that's, those are two different animals, mobiles in parks and mobiles on land, mobiles on private land that you're also going to buy. You can find comps online mm -hmm. through the MLS and mm -hmm. find out what people have paid and their you know, property appraiser right. site or. Yeah. You know, and I liked how you said, I'm glad this isn't easy because it keeps people kind of out of it. 
you know, and you're able to uh, just start with very little money here because uh, I know we're going to jump into some other steps, but I wouldn't imagine this is something you can really get funding for unless funding would probably be challenging here uh, because a lot of lenders wouldn't necessarily want to lend on a mobile home, even if it had the land, you're pretty much just getting a land loan. And then if you're just buying the mobile home itself without anything, uh, you're in a whole different way of funding, correct? Correct. Over the last number of years, there's been a few more loan products for like end users that are going to buy a home in a park or with land. You know, there's a few more loan products that have come out. But for the most part, many mobile homes are difficult to get financed. The home has to qualify, the foundation, the buyer. Uh, yeah. Maybe private money, like once people do a couple deals and then they're, they're vocal about it, yeah. you know, there, there is private money out there, people. Yeah, just normal people or people at the exactly. real estate clubs. Like, it's, oh, I see someone doing money. something good. You know, I want some of that. I hear, you know. Yeah, exactly. And this is, this is also a good time for you to get, uh, to use business lines of credit, credit cards, you know, like your more traditional, uh, you know, how to just pull money together for any business. So interesting. It's, uh, yeah, I remember back in the day when I was doing a lot of, uh, a lot of mobile homes, it was all about that permanent foundation. That was a big expense for us because we'd put a permanent foundation on it, then it would qualify. Uh, we did a lot of rent to owns. So people would rent it with the option to buy. The money they put down, we'd put a permanent foundation underneath it and we'd work on getting them, getting them qualified. So I've, I've played that game uh, you know, a little bit and it was, it was very profitable for a long time. Beautiful. So step, step two was knowing who's out there. What does who's out there mean to you? Knowing who's out there is, is the seller's. So that's, that's, that's the who gotcha. in, this, in this case. Um, knowing who's out there is definitely the sellers. We're dealing with, uh, oftentimes we're not dealing with millionaires. The people that we help, sometimes they're in fragile, uh, delicate, vulnerable situations. We're helping people that are, um, a lot of the folks we help are paycheck to paycheck, which actually around the country, most people are paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. So when we're helping folks, you know, some people need to leave real soon. Some people have plenty of time. And for the, for the listeners, I want them to understand, I think it's a big fallacy or it's a big uh, mistake that, you know, people, they go, they come from single family home investing. They see a mobile home that's worth 20 grand or 10 grand or 30 grand. They talk them down a little bit of money. And then it's like, this must be a good deal. Like this is, I can get this whole home for just, you know, 30 grand or 20 grand or five. And that might not be the case. In my opinion, the person listening to my voice should get clarity on the entire marketplace, not just the stuff on Craigslist or Facebook, really understand, shake the tree and understand who's out there, what are they selling and why? And then, you know, what are they selling and why? You're not just guessing, you're actually listening to them and then making strategic offers to everyone, everyone that fits your criteria, you know, let's make strategic offers to those folks and you don't need to buy five or 10 homes at once. You want to buy one with the path of least resistance and people have different time. They have different money. They have different capital and goals. So, you know, what my path of least resistance might not be somebody else's path of least resistance. So it's important to get clarity on who's out there and then again, move forward one at a time with the path of least resistance. So when I say yeah. get clarity, I mean the, the sellers. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And our, uh, in our, our pins, our software that we're going to be giving away to one of the listeners here shortly, we have the ability to search for, for mobile homes. I haven't dug into it too deep. I might, I might give you uh, access to the software and have you dig into it to make sure it, it, works, it works for you. I haven't personally used it for that. But um, outside of our software, where are some places that you've been able to find mobile homes? I've seen mobile home parks on LoopNet. I've seen, uh, you know, where, where are you finding these deals? The deals or the, or the parks or the, I just, yeah. Anything that you're buying, like how are you finding these, these sellers, whether it's the parks or the individual, uh, you know, trailers. Of course. So in my opinion, you know, there's only so many parks around anyone's one given area. Um, and so in my opinion, I want folks to sort of dominate their local area. Now you're not going to, over the next year or two, you know, if you're buying mobile homes in parks, um, you're probably only going to be investing in a couple parks. Like even if you buy 10 or 12 homes, you can have a really decent business in just a small handful of parks. But I'm not going to say that those parks are all like two miles from your home. You're going to be driving, you know, 50 miles this way, 20 miles that way, 10 miles over here. So to go back to your question about where are we finding these deals, part of this business is being at the right place at the right time. 
part of it's being having a good reputation and part of it's uh, you know acting quickly of course but from the very beginning you know all of the mobile home parks around you all of the mobile home neighborhoods ar around you there's no way for me to hide the fact that i would like people to go to every single mobile home park around them to understand what's out there who's selling what to talk to people to put out some advertising and that's just food and that's just feet on the ground that's not including obviously something you know basic stuff like bandit signs potentially mailers eventually um, not on doors maybe maybe not different tax sales and then you get homes on land there's a number of ways to attack those folks with certain with certain lists networking to other movers and other investors and managers and owners so it's not just one way that we're finding deals it's a combination of all these like trip wires that people are looking for that you know there's not many people like us there's not many mobile home investors so you know we put out enough sort of advertisements and tripwires out there for people to either find us mm -hmm. or we're going to find them. And I prefer not to find them on Craigslist or Facebook. Once they're on the market, you know, those are okay, but those are kind of like retail priced homes. I want to find people before they put any sign in the window, before they're, you know, when they have questions, when they're just thinking about selling. Um, yeah. And that's a combination of stuff online and then stuff offline. Like I mentioned, mm -hmm. just getting through those parks, having boots on the ground, doing a number of things while you're there. So. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's really good insight. You know, just hanging outside the front of the trailer park, giving away, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you get one of those sandwich board, like, uh, yeah, there you go. Signs where you flip the oh man. Well, you said you used to work at a uh, McDonald's or Walmart before you did all this. You can just be handing out McDonald's coupons, talking to everyone. <laughs> you ever need to sell? Suit. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm your man. Um, so step three is what I'm most excited about hearing, um, making a massive amount of offers. So, you know what people are paying, you know who's out there selling, you're trying to get to them ahead of time, uh, just like you are in any real estate uh, deal. And now you're making a massive amount of offers. How do you, uh, you know, scale that? What, what does that mean to you? In the beginning, I mean, people's definition of success, I think is all different. You know, some folks want to understand things. Some folks want to do one to two deals a month. Others have some monetary goal. Um, People start with so much money. You know, some people have 20 grand, 10,000 or $100,000 or more. And so it, you know, for the massive amount of, of, of offers, I say that because be, having been in this business for so long, this is a conveyor belt type of business where there's always going to be more sellers out there. Next month, there's different sellers. The month after that, the month after that, the month after that. So there's always more, you know, the conveyor belt of people needing to leave for a variety of reasons. And I run a business. I, when I talk to sellers, I want to give them offers. It might not save their day. It might not be the best thing out there, but I want to tell most sellers how this company that I work with can help them. So I need to take into account what they want. I need to take into account what I have, my exit strategy. But I think everyone that I talk to, everyone that I go and especially have an appointment with, they deserve answers. They deserve an offer. I'm not pretending to come in on my you know, horse with, you know, can save the day for everybody, but I want to help you know, one person at a time. So I want to make a massive amount of offers. Um, I want to be frugal. Just because I have the money doesn't mean I want to spend it. So I'm usually making them a combination of offers, a cash one, a payment one, maybe balloon, maybe a combination of payments and balloon. So that's what I mean by a massive amount of offers and not only make the massive amount of offers and then it's not like, okay, take it or leave it. Goodbye. Understand what you just said, you know, understand how the seller is taking your, your offers, how, understand how close you are. If you're close, try to get to a deal. And if you're not, you know, follow up and keep in touch, learn what they sold for, learn if they get more motivated, renegotiate later down the road. And then progressively one deal after another, this is not a get rich quick business, but one, you know, deal after another, you know, in a couple months, in a couple of years, you have 20 homes in your portfolio, you know, 15 homes, 10 homes, 30 homes. What so, you, yeah. And what do you, what are you seeing at the light, the end of the tunnel? you have these 20 or 30 homes, what does that kind of passively spit out to you each month? Not including down payments, every payment, every time you sell a mobile home with, with some type yeah. of 
rent to own, owner financing, you're going to get a down payment. And the down payment's dependent on the condition of the home. If you're selling like a handyman special, maybe you get a couple grand down or less if it needs more work. But if you get a, you know, selling a home that's ready to be moved into, five, six, ten thousand dollars depending on your area. But the monthly cash flow, a minimum, at least in my business and the folks I work with, three hundred dollars minimum, all the way up to four hundred, four fifty, five fifty, but mid three three hundred minimum that we're getting in cash flow. Unless you have some sort of debt service to the seller, you're you're making the seller some some payments then your cash flow might go down. But every home that we put into our portfolio is a minimum of three, $300 a month. Yeah, I mean, that's, that could be a, you know, a passive $100,000 a year you know, for you out there, just kind of coming in like clockwork every, uh, every month, uh, not even counting the down payments. So yeah, just, I'm sorry, I kind of side you there, but as far as making these, making these offers, um, you're just kind of making everyone some sort of an offer. Um, is there any sort of automation you use there? Is it kind of case by case? Um, There's some automation with regards to maybe taking the phone calls, pre-screening the initial phone calls, but I like talking to the sellers. I don't, that's something I need to do better is outsource and delegate. I will fully admit that. But I really think that talking to the sellers, building rapport with them down the road, making offers, excuse me, making, making offers to them, that's something that I should be doing. The paperwork, you know, meeting with the seller to close, selling the home, uh, repairs, all that can be outsourced. But personally, I like talking to sellers. I like understanding their situation, being like a little detective and like trying to help them. And Yeah. Um, you know, for anyone who listened to uh, one of our previous calls, we had a guy do a kind of a 2020 market update. He does a lot of due diligence for all of the big hedge funds out there. And he was like, you make your money when you buy. You know, so it makes sense that you want to be there. And it's like the last thing you would want to outsource because, you know, if you're doing it, um, you get to you get to play detective there a little bit and, <laughs> you know, find those extra uh, dollars, really. Right. Well, great. Is there is uh, there anything else here you want to let people know about mobile home investing? Oh, my gosh. Um, I mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. Um, it's not a get rich big quick business overnight. We're helping people. It's definitely a people business by far. You're listening to people. You're being a, you know, pseudo therapist sometimes. Um, but uh, it's it's full of good people. And uh, no, I don't I don't think I have anything else. Yeah, you know, <laughs> one thing I forgot to mention here on the uh, the beginning of the call is you contribute a lot of your success based uh, on your ability to listen. Why do you think that's played such a big role in your success? The book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, my first handful of years in this business, um, I was a jerk. I didn't listen to people. I was greedy. Um, I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done. And, and I wasn't happy either. I had anxiety. I wasn't happy with myself. Um, and I changed. I changed how I see people. And I realized that investors, most people in this world, they don't need our help. I mean, some people do, some people want it, some people don't, some people think they do, they don't. So it's our job to listen to people and understand like, oh, you really don't need the help of an investor. I love your home and here's what I can do to help you and call me if anything changes, pass around my name and number. But it just, I guess it was a product of this business. Like this business in, I think real estate in general is like a crash course in, in human psychology and human relationships. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, the, the whole listening thing came about from reading and self, self-improvement. Yeah, you know, it really is. When I was 19 years old and I decided I wanted to become a, a real estate millionaire, right? I'd go out there and I would, I would do anything. I would knock on doors. I would, uh, you know, I'd go down to the courthouse. I'd get the list of people in financial trouble. I'd go knock on doors. And I was a 19, 20-year-old kid sitting down with a 45-year-old, you know, father of three who lost his job trying to pretend like I could possibly understand what they were doing uh, but it was a crash course in in life and in therapy and in just kind of <laughs> listening and understanding uh you know the many realities that happen uh you know to good hard-working people who just they never get a they never get uh something else going on right they have their job they're worried about their job security they never build anything passive they never build any real wealth in uh you know in real estate and then when you know when it hits the fan, uh, there's, there's nothing to fall back on. So 
that's why so many of our, our members are here because they're like, man, I need to, I need to control my own future. Yeah. And as the investor, we can really, you know, if you've been doing this for a while, which I know, you know, both of us have, but we can really, we can set people up for success. We can set them up for failure. We can be manipulative. We can, you know, it's, I think it's our job to kind of, even though that person didn't set up any passive income, you know, and they got themselves into whatever bed that they're in or, you know, every situation, we should still try to be helping people to some extent for a long, you know, for our long-term business to make things semi win-win. Um, anyway, it's just, yeah, this, yeah. We, we are in a unique, fortunate position in, you know, us starting so young as well to help people like double, triple our age. It's crazy sometimes, or it was more back yeah. then. Well, this is a, this is a fun question I like to ask everyone. What do you think your life would be like if uh, you kept working at Walmart or McDonald's and never got into real estate? <laughs> That's such a, you know, I, I could assume things. I, I know that I wouldn't be... I was itching for something else. I mean, even, you know, just the Walmart days, the McDonald days, I knew I had so much fire in me, so much potential. I knew that there was more. Um, would I be working at a job and then probably not happy? Yes. Maybe would I be doing something on my own? Maybe. Am I really an entrepreneur or a business owner or what am I? I, I have no idea. Um, I'm so glad that I did stumble into mobile homes and I failed into mobile homes basically. Um, but my, I can't really, I don't even want to think of that. I don't even know that. <laughs> I just, that's, yeah, I don't even want to think about that. That's, well, there's uh, <laughs> some other version of you somewhere else saying, would you like fries with that? <laughs> would you like fries with that? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, I really, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you kind of breaking, breaking this down at a high level here. And uh, do you have a little bit of time for a rapid fire section? Oh, that's fun. That sounds yeah. fun. All right. So on a scale from one to 10, how strict were your parents? I had a good mix. So I know this rapid fire. I had like a good, the balance, well, not balance, but like one was way, one was one, one was a two and one was a nine. So maybe a five in the middle. Perfect. Uh, get up early or stay up late. I've been getting up earlier, but I do stay up real late. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people that are entrepreneurs just say both. Um, how many hours of sleep do you get? Ooh, on the weekends, I try to make up for it, but Monday through Friday, six to seven. Um, what is your favorite or most recent book that you read? Ooh, I know I said it before, um, and I'll say it again because I just re-downloaded it to Audible and listened to it, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, yeah, that's no, definitely one worth reading a few times. If you could be any superhero, um, who would it be? Ooh, is there like an invisibility person? I'd be that person. Okay, perfect. Sounds kind of creepy though. Like, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you going to be doing? It would be, it would be fun though. Um, <laughs> something everyone should do less of. Ooh, TV time? Something everyone should do more of. Hugs. Will people visit Mars in your lifetime? Oh man, I hope so. If I can, I'd love to go out there. Bitcoin, bang or bust? Wow, you're asking the wrong person. I hope it's a bang for the little, the few Bitcoins that I have. <laughs> there you go. Well, hey, thank you so very much for jumping on the line with us. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah. And for everyone who's here, you made it to the end of the show. Most people don't finish what they start, but you are special. You found a lot of value in the information my guest and I have been sharing with you. And all we ask in return for all of our hard hours of work is for you to give us a thumbs up, like, comment, share this with someone, interact with us in some way. Uh, your interaction is really what drives us. Any ideas you have for shows, put them in the comments. Make sure to visit our YouTube channel and subscribe so you can have this, this high, uh, high value information just coming right to your cell phone the second it's available because maybe um, mobile home investing isn't necessarily for you. Maybe you jumped on our last podcast where we showed you how to build skyscrapers. I mean, that's kind of the difference in what we show. We take you through every single uh, type of real estate investing, your wealth, your health, your happiness. That's what Exactly How is about. So please go ahead and subscribe, comment, leave a feedback, write a review. I'll see you on the next episode of Exactly How. The Connected Investors app connects you with investors, notifies you of available properties, helps locate cash buyers, and secure private funding to close deals. Set up in seconds to become a member of the Connected Investors social network. Now you can scroll through your main feed to find cash buyers, see investment properties not available to the general public, 
and network with investors by adding your own comments to a thread to keep the conversation going. The control center is your connection to add properties to sell, start new discussions, connect with local investors, and even find private funding. The notifications tab will keep you alerted to new investment properties and offers. You'll also find new friend requests to connect directly with the community to build your network. From the property marketplace, you'll be able to find, favorite, and make offers on investment properties. Download connected investors today to find, figure, fund, and flip investment properties on the go.